Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Anju Kagal and uh, today we will continue with the intestinal nematodes, part 2 of intestinal nematodes. Last time I had told you about Ascaris, Trichuris, Trichura, Enterobius, Vermicularis and today we are going to be covering the hookworms that is Necate Americanus and Ankylostoma duodenale. These are the two hookworms and Strongyloid Stercoralis. Now, all these three worms are basically soil transmitted nematodes. The two important species which affect humans are Ankylostoma duodenale and Necate americanus. They live in the small intestine and suck the host's blood. Heavy infestation in children is known to stunt their growth, reduce physical fitness and impair intellectual and cognitive development. So, coming to the morphology of Ankylostoma duodenale and Necater americanus, their eggs or ova are 60 micron in size, non bile stained, segmented and show the presence of 4 blastomeres. It is difficult to dif distinguish the eggs of both these worms in a wet mount, though there have been reports the air that eggs of Tinea saginata are acid fast. However, more studies need to be done in this field. Coming to the morphology of the adult worms, the adult worms in Necate species are tinier than Ankylostoma species and as I mentioned before with all as with all nematodes, the males are smaller than the females. So, in Necator the male is about 5 to 8 millimeters, whereas in Ankylostoma he is 9 to 11 millimeters. The female is more or less the same size in both the worms. In addition, Ankylostoma duodenale female also shows a coil at one end, therefore hook worm. The worms can further be differentiated based on their mouth parts. Ankylostoma duodenale has two pairs of teeth and Necate americanus shows cutting plates. It is with the help of these that they attach to the mucosa of the small intestine and suck blood. The copulatory bursa also helps differentiate the adult worms. In Ankylostoma duodenale, the dorsal ray is tridigitate as you can see in this picture on the left and the spicules are not fused. Whereas, in Necate americanus the dorsal ray is bidigitate. So, you can see that there is only there are only two divisions and the spicules are fused. The larval forms of the hookworm consist of the newly hatched rhabditiform larva which then matures into the infective filariform larva. The rhabditiform larva is short and stout, whereas the filariform larva is slim and long. Reservoirs and vectors, for hookworm man is the definitive host. The larva exists in the soil and also in the human host on its travels to the small intestine. However, the main the, uh, form which is found in the humans, the one which actually causes a lot of damage is the adult worm. Ankylostoma caninum is the hook worm of dogs. Very rarely it may infect humans who then become the dead end hosts. 
because once the larva enters it cannot spread to any part in the human body. Transmission, Nekete species are transmitted percutaneously. Ankylostoma species besides percutaneous transmission can also be transmitted orally and probably even transplacently. The sites of penetration in the skin are usually the skin thin skin between the toes, the dorsum of the feet and the inner side of the soles. That is where usually the lava enters from. In the case of gardeners and miners, the skin of the hands may also be a source of entry. So, let us look at the life cycle. Again, like I told you that uh, I spoke to you about the direct cycle for whipworm and pinworm, the modified direct cycle for roundworm and now we come to the indirect cycle that is the life cycle of hookworms and strongyloid stercoralis. So, as far as the hookworm is concerned eggs are passed in the feces, these then mature into the rhabditiform larva. This maturation of the rhabditiform larva takes about 1 to 2 days provided an optimal environment is provided. And what is this uh, in uh, optimal en environment? So, these are fussy uh, worms. So, they need to be in a shaded, cool, moist place. Then they will develop into the rhabditiform larvae. These further develop into the slender infective filariform larvae over the next 5 to 10 days. Filariform larvae can under the correct environmental conditions stay alive for up to 3 to 4 weeks. And it is this filariform larva which penetrates the skin. So, again put your mind to some imagination, you see this little larva who is quite happy playing around in the soil with his other larval friends and this person suddenly comes and stomps on him. So, can you imagine this cross looking larva? what he decides to do, he says I am going to bite this man and then when he bites, he ends up penetrating and going into the subcutaneous venules or the lymphatics from where he goes to the heart, he is carried to the heart, to the lungs. In the pulmonary alveoli, he breaks through the pulmonary alveoli and we have got our teenage larva out here who decides now that he has to go on a trek. So, again trudges up the trek here, reaches the top of the hill, peeps over, looks into the esophagus and falls into it, sliding down very gleefully till he reaches the stomach, where he does not enjoy the acidic environment. And so, he quickly makes a getaway and reaches the small intestine and here he will mature into the adult worm. Now, the adult worm will attach to the intestinal wall and lead this leads to blood loss. So, what happens is that the worms uh, stick on, they will go to one particular patch, suck the blood from there and move off. But before they move off to be able to suck that blood, they secrete an enzyme. All right. So, even after they move off, some amount of leakage continues then they go to another spot and start sucking blood over there. The lifespan of an adult worm is 1 to 2 years and each adult worm Nekete americanus adult, adult worm throws out 9 to 10 thousand eggs per day. Ankylostoma duodenale throws out 25 to 30 thousand eggs per day. Right. So, you can imagine how they manage to transmit or spread the infection. Coming to the pathogenicity and clinical features, majority of the infections are asymptomatic. However, 
in patients who have heavy infections there can be symptomatic uh, there can be symptoms sorry uh, due to the migrating larva or due to the adult worm. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier these worms are very tiny the adult worms are really small and therefore, they cannot really cause obstruction. Symptoms produced by the larva include lesions in the skin, lesions in the lung and a new disease vacana disease which is caused by ankylostoma duodenale larvae which are ingested. So, let us look at the skin lesions you get something called ankylostoma dermatitis or ground itch. This usually occurs at the site of entry and lasts for about 2 to 4 weeks and although it is called ankylostoma dermatitis it is more common with necotair infections. So, the slide on the picture on the upper right side shows you what a ground itch looks like. The next lesion that the larvae can produce is called creeping eruption. These are reddish itchy papules which have a serpentous appearance and appear along the path of travel of the filariform larvae also referred to as larva migrants. Now, these larvae after they have produced these uh, in the skin which happens 1 to 2 weeks after entry will then burrow deeper and get into the subcutaneous venules from there to the heart and then to the lungs. Now, when they reach the lungs they produce cough and pneumonitis and this usually happens because of tracheal irritation when the worm is traveling when the larva is going up the trachea and this happens one week after the worm has finished with the symptoms that it has produced on the skin. Vakana disease is characterized by nausea, vomiting, pharyngeal irritation, irritation, cough, dyspnea and hoarseness of voice and this is seen with ankylostoma duodenale. Hookworms like I told you they attach to the intestinal wall in the case of uh, ankylostoma duodenale it has nice teeth with which it attaches and in the case of Necotea americanus it has the plates with which it attaches to the intestinal mucosa. The severity of symptoms depends on the load or the worm burden. So, if a person has 100 to 500 larvae the worm load is considered low and usually there are no symptoms or mild symptoms. In the case of medium load which is 500 or more larvae and a large load which is 1000 or greater these are the people who will present with the characteristic signs and symptoms of a hookworm manifestation of a hookworm infestation I am sorry. So, the most common ones are epigastric pain, diarrhea and vomiting during the early phase of the illness and when the hookworm infestation is large then the patient will have a chronic blood loss and he will present with a microcytic hypochromic anemia. Each adult hookworm sucks about 0.2 milliliter of blood per day and like I said that at the puncture sites also hemorrhage continues for some time even after the worm has moved away. Epigastric pain, diarrhea and vomiting usually occurs 4 to 6 weeks after ground itch. What are the clinical features of a hookworm anemia? there will be extreme pallor, the patient will show abnormal appetite, he will have a perverted taste for mud, lime, epigastric tenderness with dyspepsia is often a feature and as the blood loss continues 
then the patient will have a characteristic puffy face, pedal anema, anemia. In young children less than 5 years, growth is stunted, mental and cognitive impairment occurs. And so you have a child who is pale, plump with a protuberant abdomen and dry lustreless hair. Eosinophilic enteritis is presents as repeated episodes of abdominal pain in 97 percent of cases. And these episodes their severity increases gradually. Eosinophilia is seen in practically all the patients, mucocytosis in about three fourth of the patients and extreme cases this eosinophilic enteritis may present as with signs and symptoms of appendicitis or intestinal perforation. So, diagnosis of hookworm infestation is done primarily by doing a stool examination. You could do a gross examination, but you will have to really be careful and be able to, to be able to look for the worms which I told you are very small in size about 1 centimeter. So, we usually do microscopy and as is the case we usually look for the ova in a saline preparation and why is that because we want to differentiate whether they are bile stained or non bile stained. So, in the case of uh, hookworm Necata americanus as well as ankylostoma duodenale the ova are non bile stained 60 micron in size and may show segmented blastomeres. Occult stool may be positive for occult blood. These two pictures again show you what the hookworm ova can look like. On the left is a saline preparation and on the right is an iodine preparation. If you want to preserve the specimen, you can fix it in the in 10 percent formalin and in case you do not find the ova and you want to do concentration methods, then sedimentation techniques are the ones we use for hookworm. If you remember for Ascaris, we used flotation techniques. The wet mount of the sediment over here is examined for the presence of the worms. Sometimes, if we preserve the stool at the right temperature uh, with enough moisture and in a cool environment, the ova will hatch and pr produce rhabditiform larvae. If it is kept long enough for another 5 to 10 days, these rhabditiform larvae may also mature into the infective filariform larvae. The larvae can be identified based on the mouth parts and based on the uh, length of the alimentary canal. A smear examination of the blood would reveal a hypochromic microcytic anemia together with an eosinophilia. Treatment of hookworm infestations is done with albendazole a single dose or daily for 3 days, mebendazole 100 milligram twice daily for 3 days. Mebendazole given for 3 days is found to be more effective than a single dose. Thiabendazole creams may be applied topically to attack the migrating lava in cutaneous lava migrants. Pyrental palm weight may also be given to treat hookworm infestations. Wheezing and cough are managed with inhaled beta agonists. So, therefore, when you have a patient with a hookworm infestation, so you usually the patient is going to present to you when he is anemic and therefore, it becomes important to try and elicit a history about whether the patient had any 
lesions on the skin like an urticarial rash, serpentine rash, whether this was followed by any pulmonary symptoms like a dry cough due to irritation of the trachea to indicate whether this anemia may be because of a hookworm infestation. In addition to treating getting rid of the worms, we must also treat the patient's anemia, give vitamin C supplements and also give anti-itch medications like Benadryl, Atarax or a hydrocortisone cream for the cutaneous larva migrants. For prevention and control of hookworm infestations, there should be proper sanitation measures, sewage should be properly disposed. Personal protection is very important and therefore, those who work in soil should wear boots, gardeners should wear gloves. Simultaneous treatment of carriers and the diseased will ensure that there is treatment of the whole community. So, with this I have come to the end of the hookworms, Ankylostoma duodenale and Necate americanus which had an indirect cycle which entered the host through penetration of the skin, reached the lungs and through the trachea got into the intestine where the adult worms matured and did their job of being blood suckers leading to the clinical manifestations of anemia. So, with this I move on to the next one, next soil transmitted nematode and that is Strongyloids stercoralis. Now, Strongyloids stercoralis the adult worm is only 2 to 2.5 millimeter in length it lies in the cecum and the large intestine and usually the adult worm is not seen unless somebody has done a colonoscopy and picked it up from there. This particular worm is ovo viviparis that is as soon as the eggs are laid they immediately hatch into the uh, larvae form. And this is the only nematode in which we find larval forms in the stool. You will never find the ova or strongyloid stercoralis. And this is what the larva looks like, the picture on the left. Coming to the life cycle. Now, this particular worm also has an indirect life cycle. And to make life miserable for you all, it has a different kind of mode of transmission. So, let us start with the rhabditiform larva which has been excreted in the stool. As I told you, you never find the eggs, you will find the rhabditiform larvae over here. Now, this rhabditiform larva can in the soil develop into adult worms which will then produce fertilized eggs all right these eggs will mature and you will get the formation of a rhabditiform larva again and this rhabditiform larva can then develop into the infective filariform larva all right and the filary infected filariform larva is the cross larva who was stomped upon and decided to and he had decided to bite the host all right. Now, coming back to the excreted larva in the stool, this can this rhabditiform larva in the soil instead of developing into an adult can develop into the filariform larva which then infects the host. So, it penetrates the skin and from there it enters the circulatory system, is transported to the lungs, penetrates the alveolar space, comes out, starts its trek up the trachea and then into the pharynx, into the esophagus, 
and down into the stomach and lava reaches the small intestine where it becomes an adult. Now, this adult worm then migrates down the lumen towards the large intestine and there the eggs are laid which immediately become the larval form all right. Now, this larval form, so there is another thing out here. Now, do you remember the first one was that the rabidity form larva which was passed out in the stool became into adult worms which then produced an egg again became a rabidity form larva which matured into a filary form larva or you had the rabidity form larva which then matured into a filary form larva which entered the host all right. Now, sometimes these rabidity form larvae end up penetrating the intestinal mucosa all right. They become the they become filary form larvae and they enter the intestinal mucosa usually in the perianal region all right. And once they have entered the skin through the perianal region again via the venules or via lymphatics they are carried to the lungs and the cycle is repeated. Now, when this kind of an infection occurs it is referred to as auto infection all right. So, this is the life cycle of strongyloids stercoralis. So, what are the types of infection just to revise you have auto infection where the filary form larva re enters the intestinal lumen or through the perineal or perianal skin it penetrates and this leads to persistence of the infection. Hyperinfection occurs in individuals who are usually on steroids or immunosuppressive therapy due to malignancy. It can also occur in malnourished rarely in pregnant patients and of course, nowadays one of the main causes of immunosuppression is AIDS and it can cause hyperinfection in these patients also. So, let us look at the clinical manifestations of strongyloids. We start there are three forms there is acute strongyloidiasis. Here the patient will have localized pruritic erythematous rash which in the case of strongyloids stercoralis is referred to as lava currents all right. Again it is a serpentine kind of rash which is very itchy and occurs at the site of skin penetration. As it travels up to the lungs in the lungs it causes tracheal irritation and the patient may have a dry cough and once it is swallowed patient may have diarrhea sometimes constipation some patients may have non-specific abdominal pain and anorexia. Chronic or persistent strongyloidosis in the early stages is usually asymptomatic. However, you can suspect it in patients who will report to you with an urticarial serpingous rash on the buttocks, perineum and thighs. These patients in addition will also have epigastric pain intermittent episodes of diarrhea and constipation. So, when you have a patient who is coming to you with this kind of a serpingous pruritic rash on the thighs and buttocks and has epigastric pain with intermittent episodes of diarrhea or constipation you must definitely think of a persistent strongyloid infection. Very rarely these patients will show the presence of occult blood in their feces and still more rarely some of them can land up with massive colonic or gastric hemorrhage. Seventy five percent of individuals with chronic strongyloidiasis have mild peripheral 
eosinophilia and their Ig levels are raised. Hyperinfection and disseminated strongyloidosis. So, patients who have a subclinical infection receiving high dose of corticosteroids it could be for treating acute exacerbations of asthma or patients with COPD or patients with malignancy who are on uh, immunosuppressive drugs. In these patients, you are likely to get hyperinfection or disseminated strongyloidosis. So, what happens is there is an accelerated auto infection and an overwhelming number of migrating larvae. In hyperinfection syndrome, the larvae are limited to the gastrointestinal tract and the lungs. Whereas, in disseminated strongyloidosis, the larvae can invade numerous organs. These patients present with gastrointestinal manifestations, just like those intermittent bouts of diarrhea, constipation, sometimes occult blood in the stool. But these patients may also present with ileus, bowel edema, intestinal obstruction because this is not because of the worms per se, but intestinal obstruction, mucosal ulceration, massive hemorrhage and because of these larvae entering into the blood circulation or into the peritoneum, they can give rise to peritonitis or bacterial sepsis. Pulmonary manifestations and findings could be cough, wheezing, dyspnea, hoarseness, pneumonitis, hemoptysis and in the extreme cases respiratory failure. Radiological diagnosis and x-ray of the chest would show diffuse interstitial infiltrates or consolidation. In the case of worms which have migrated to other sites, you have you can have neurological symptoms like an aseptic or gram negative meningitis. Larvae are very rarely seen in the cerebrospinal fluid, meningeal vessels, dura, epidural, subdural and subarachnoid space. The associated systemic signs and symptoms could be peripheral edema and ascites which is usually secondary to hypoalbuminemia, recurrent gram negative bacteremia or sepsis. In these patients what is surprising is that eosinophilia is frequently absent. Okay, so, we have gone through the clinical presentation of a person with strongyloids infection you can have an acute infection, you could have a chronic or persistent infection and you can have either hyperinfection or disseminated strongyloidosis because of re reduced immune, reduced immunity basically due to immunosuppression. Laboratory diagnosis, laboratory diagnosis is very important. Like I said, in the patients who have acute strongyloidosis, very often the patient may have very mild symptoms and therefore, if you have to diagnose the condition, you have to demonstrate the presence of the larva in the stool. Okay, this can be done by concentration method also, but in case one does not succeed, one can also do a duodenal aspirate in which you will be able to find a rhabditiform larva. Very often one can also do the string test and just to familiarize you with what the string test is, it basically consists of an empty capsule which is attached to a string and the patient is made to swallow it and this reaches the ileum where it is left, it lies there for some time. So, the 
you have swallowed this uh, capsule and the string is taped onto your cheek and it is left like that for some time. After about 2 to 3 hours this is then withdrawn and the liquid which is in the capsule is then put on a slide covered with a cover slip and very often you will be able to find the larvae of strongyloids stercoralis. Antibody detection can also be performed and amongst all the indirect hemagglutination tests, the IFA test they found that ELISA is the best. You can detect the presence of IgG antibodies to the filarial larva. Now this uh, these immunological tests are usually done in patients where you are suspecting a strongyloids infection and despite doing repeated stool examinations or repeated duodenal aspirate examinations you have not been able to demonstrate the larvae. But presence of these antibodies does not help you differentiate between a past and a present infection. However, in a patient who is being treated for strongyloid stercoralis infection, this demonstration of the antibody titer may help in determining whether the patient has been treated successfully or not. So, when you want to monitor the treatment after the treatment period is complete, 2 months after that sorry 6 months after that it should show a definite fall in titer of IgG levels. This would indicate that the treatment has been successful which of course brings me to treatment. So, even in asymptomatic patients it is important that strongyloids infections are treated because they can prove to be fatal. Avoid giving steroids in such patients. Treatment in the past used to consist of giving thiobendazole for 2 days. This was replaced by ivermectin. For disseminated strongyloidosis thiobendazole is given for 5 to 7 days. Whereas, ivermectin is given daily till symptoms have result which would also mean you would have to do repeated stool examinations to confirm that the larvae have disappeared. So, the larvae should not be detectable at least 2 weeks after completion of treatment. So, to conclude we discussed intestinal nematodes. The intestinal nematode where you see larvae in the stool is strongyloid stercoralis. The ones where you see eggs in the stool are the ones which are bile stained are Ascaris lumbricoids and Trichuris trichura. The non bile stained ones are Ankylostoma duodenale and Necate americanus. And eggs which are found on the perianal skin are the non bile stained E. vermicularis eggs. So, thank you. I hope you have understood intestinal nematodes. Thank you.